Welcome back to the Grand Solar Minimum channel. Today is Wednesday, June 26, 2019. Before we start tonight's broadcast, I'd like to briefly address a certain situation that occurred earlier today. As you know, here at the Grand Solar Minimum channel, we uh, try to give every channel on the community its own space to create its own opinion, and that is quite all right. Not a problem with having differences of opinions on theories. The one thing that I found offensive today was that uh, Ben Davidson of uh, his channel, Suspicious Observers, accused Mari, myself, and Valentina Zarkova at, of flip-flopping to man-made global warming. Also challenged us that we didn't even read the paper. Now, Ben's been doing this for a long time. Ben knows his science really well. Uh, we've respected Ben for a couple years that we've been doing this. We've actually complimented him several times. But today's behavior and actions from Ben is very confusing. Uh, this paper was accepted, peer-reviewed. It went through the process, but there's a problem with this paper, apparently even though it's peer-reviewed, but now there's an issue with it. But the biggest thing that really offended me the most today was that we were accused of flip-flopping to the man-made global warming theory. And I think if anybody is watching tonight, you go back through the video collection here that we've had from this channel from day one, and you will not find one shred of evidence of us supporting man-made global warming. Now, I can't sit here and speculate on why Ben did what he did today or what his motive was, but for him to accuse this channel and other channels alike, like Adapt2030 and Diamond over there at the Oppenheimer Ranch Project, or Oppenheimer, I'm sorry, um, accusing us of screwing the community because of, of, of following Dr. Zarkova's work. People are upset right now about the, the warming part of this. And here's what I gotta say about that. And it talks about it here at the bottom of this paper that was just released. No, no, nobody's had the correct time to go over this information yet. All right, nobody, I don't care who you are. It's Tuesday or it's Wednesday for Christ's sakes. So here's our COVID is talking about terrestrial temperatures going up by 2,600 to two and a half to three degrees Celsius. She is predicting a warming of 0.5 degrees Celsius per 100 years. Terrestrial temperatures now. Uh, this is basing it off of the um, monitor minimum baseline. So going up from there, and then we fast forward a little bit to where they describe that minima will continue to decrease in their solar activity and maxima will continue to grow. Uh, the part that's got everybody really upset here is that also I want to point this out as well. They're talking about these next two grand cycles, 2020 through 2055 and 2370 through 2415. These, these larger cycles happen every 350 to 400 years with these uh, grand solar minimums. These two eras of grand solar minimums, three de I believe it's three decades for the 2020, and of course four decades for the one 350 years away. So both eras are expected to be having temperatures of that of the modern minimum or worse. The paper ends with these oscillations of the estimated terrestrial temperature do not include any human induced factors which were outside the scope of the current paper. That doesn't mean that there are human induced factors they need to include. This paper is trying to tell you that this is all natural. There's nothing factored in here about humans and their contributions. And everybody that follows the work of Dr. Zarkova and Grand Solar Minimum Theory, 
we don't favor the idea that humans have anything to do with the climate. But yet, we were accused today of supporting man-made law. I think it's him that he just, maybe he read it too fast. Maybe he didn't take time to, we're still going through it. But again, this is all natural. Now, Ben, at his Observer's Frontier, uh, I think it was last year in February, he had an interview done by one of the people that are associated with his uh, project, and they interviewed Lisa, Lisa Upton. And she told us that uh, Solar Cycle 25 was going to be slightly above where we're at now. And even if it was weaker, human activity has more to do with the climate than the sun does. That's what she said. Now, guys, I got to be honest with you. Uh, There's no way I would allow that kind of an interview on my channel if I didn't believe in man-made global warming. There's no way, I don't care who the scientist was, if somebody got on my program and told me that man was causing global warming, I I wouldn't put it on the air. I wouldn't put it through an edit. I'd just say, well, that goes out the window. We don't believe that. But yet people that he trusts And in fact, back in November, Ben had said how much he trusts Lisa Upton, one of the top scientists out there and most well-credible scientists out there. These are Ben's words, not mine. Yet he's promoting a woman who believes that human activity has more to do with the climate than the sun. Now, these are just the facts, guys. Are we done with the paper? No. We've read parts over it multiple times. This kind of stuff takes time. We're slowly sifting through it. Just like everybody else is right now. No one Now, we will have a lot of answers tomorrow because we are going to be speaking with Valentina Zarkova herself. And all these questions will be answered. See, the main distraction of what's happened today is... I'm going to say this right now. This paper was peer-reviewed and accepted in a science journal, well-respected science journal. The information is coming out now for a reason. And what Ben is suggesting is destroying the credibility of Dr. Zarkova because her information doesn't line up with his information or the people who tell him what to read, I should say. Guys, I'll tell you what right now, get mad at me in 2031 if we are in the situation that Zarkova and others are predicting. I'd rather be ready for it than not ready for it. Ben wants you to think we've got 11 more years before we have to worry about things getting out of hand. Again, we're going to have the interview tomorrow with Valentina Zarkova herself. We'll try to have it up on the air for you guys sometime in the evening hours. She will be answering questions like this. Uh, What did she mean about the warming? I know what she means. Just because we have grand solar minimums on the way for three decades doesn't mean we don't warm back up a little bit for the other seven decades. We'll also get to the bottom of what a super grand solar minimum is. These were, this was also one of the slides that was blurred out during the presentation and we will get a clear, um, indication and a thorough answer about what a super grand uh, super grand solar minimum cycle is was it misinterpreted could have been or maybe some of you had it right the whole time but again instead of putting your viewers through this bin and putting my viewers through this I don't understand why we couldn't have communicated in a private manner and talked this out like professionals again I'm not an expert I report on Grand Solar Minimum related news and I try to bring the community the best information possible and it's thoroughly vetted believe you me I'm not interested in a a war with another channel on on YouTube we don't have time for that and I think a lot of you out there who are watching tonight are pretty smart and that's why you're here in the first place you understand that So, again, thank you for tuning in to the Grand Solar Minimum channel. 
Today is Wednesday, June 26, 2019. And let's get started here at the grandsolarminimum.com. Our space weather right now, solar wind speeds are sitting at a 387.8 kilometers per second with a density of 6.6. .6. Now let's go over to spaceweather.com. We still see AR2743 very weak. It is a member of solar cycle 24, sunspot number 12. And while we're here, let's take a look at the TCI, which has not moved an inch. It's still at 3.56. Uh, TCI is the thermosphere, the very top of the atmosphere. We are now keeping track of that is cooling as well. My goodness, look at this, folks. This is absolutely gorgeous. Sorry, this was not part of the show, but I wanted to show this picture here. Uh, we've talked about Noctilucid Cloud so much this year, and these are just absolutely breathtaking photographs uh, that we are receiving right now. This is, guys... It is a scary time, but at the same time, what a time to be alive. What we are witnessing right now, no one in, no one's alive to talk about this last grand solar minimum. We don't have any actual account of the last grand solar minimum. We do on records and paper, but we don't have what we have right. And the best thing about it is that we have all this equipment to monitor everything. The Parker probe, you name it, SDO, everything that we have right now no one has ever, ever viewed this grand solar minimum quite like the generation that's viewing it right now. So we are lucky in some ways. All right, let's take a look at space weather over at the grandsolarminimum.com. KP indices are light right now, sitting at a one. We were at a zero earlier, and the 24-hour max is sitting at a two. Let's zoom in on the SDO, see if we have anything a brewin here. And uh, I've had a lot of trouble from this actual uh, image here. Just from the still shot, we can see that we have a active region just on the eastern limb of our star. Come on, baby, you can do it. Again, no real large coronal holes to really affect the magnetic field of Earth at this time. We are watching a region on the far eastern limb that could be an active region. Uh, let's take a look at the whole view. Yeah, looking at the negative 90, and we've got quite a flurry of activity uh, coming around the eastern limb right now. So we'll have to take a look at this, but some coronal holes, a pretty large one as well. So we'll definitely be on the lookout because, folks, uh, space weather is getting weird, and so is the volcanoes and the earthquakes, and we've got a lot to talk about with that tonight. Let's go ahead and take a quick look at our TSI readings for June 17, 2019. We came in at 1360.59, so uh, TSI kind of leveling back out to where it was before we had that little bit of an increase in TSI. Let's get right to the stories tonight, folks. Also want to mention uh, thank you to the watchers for bringing up uh, Irina Kitashevili with NASA on her 25 cycle, her prediction for solar cycle 25, that is. Uh, if you click on here and go to the watchers, they give a little write up here. And thankfully, they have included the, well, once it shows up, there's a video right here that will show up that leads to our, uh, our channel and the presentation that Irina present, presented for us to uh, talk about 25 and how much lower than it's going to be than the current 24. So. Thanks once again to the watchers for recognizing this work. Uh, again, it should be on everyone's front page for news as far as updates on what's actually happening with our climate. It's hard to get the truth most of the time. But talking about space weather, low KP indices, coronal holes on the horizon, and an uptick in volcanoes just about everywhere we look. A major explosion at Srombali volcano in Italy happened at 2303 UTC on June 25th, 2019. Video recorded by the surveillance camera show pyroclastic material has fallen into the Scaria del Fuoco inside the crater terrace with blocks that have surpassed its edge. The seismic signal associated with the event lasted for about four minutes. After this major explosion, no further major explosions uh, were observed. The seismic tracing returned to levels prior to the explosion and normal Strombolian activity is visible from surveillance cameras once again. Ah, there it is. Thank you for showing up, Mr. Video. 
And just a quick look at it here. That's just a little bit there. But awesome satellite imagery here. Whoa! Let's watch that again, folks. Let out a little hiccup. That right there, kind of like a, a release of some natural gases. We'll leave a link here at thegrandsolarminimum.com. Thanks again to watchers.news for their constant coverage. And here we go, more volcano news. SO2 at historically high levels, White Island alert levels have been raised in New Zealand. Moderate volcano unrest is taking place at New Zealand's White Island volcano, forcing authorities to raise the volcano alert to a two and an aviation color code to yellow on June 26th. Now, um, New Zealand is near where we have these 7.3 earthquakes out in the middle of the ocean. Um, so could this have anything to do with the earthquake swarm? Who knows? It was moving further and further south down the line. And what was interesting about that is I remember a uh, subscriber challenging me that there might be an earthquake in New Zealand of 4.4. However, we are witnessing volcanic arrest, volcanic unrest, I should say. So I'll give you credit for that. Um, maybe we didn't get the, the earthquake, but we definitely got the volcano. Uh, our heightened monitoring of this volcano as part of response to recent earthquake swarms that we just mentioned has shown an increase of sulfur dioxide gas flux to historically high levels. A gas flight today detected 1,886 tons per day of sulfur dioxide, nearly three times the previous values measured in 2019, that was the month of May. This is the highest value recorded since 2013 and the second highest since regular measurements began in 2003. Further gas measurements will be undertaken as soon as conditions will allow. A ner nearby earthquake swarms are continuing, although at lower levels than reported in on previous bulletins. It is still unclear the relationship of the earthquake swarms and the high sulfur dioxide observed today. The change in gas flux represents a significant change in our background monitoring parameters of this volcano, the White Island, and is consistent with the moderate and heightened volcanic unrest. As such, we have changed the volcano alert to level two and the av aviation code to a yellow. So once again, another volcano alert, and from a region that was seeing 7.0 or higher um, earthquakes in the middle of the ocean. Here is the big story of the day, spectacular stratospheric eruption, volcanic ash up to 63,000 feet in Yulon, PNG. Satellite imagery obtained 830 UTC, June 26, an ongoing volcanic ash eruption approximately, approximately 63,000 feet above sea level extending in all uh, directions. Volcanic ash, 44,000 feet, continues to drift south and is expected to dissipate within six hours. Uh, now, this is also in the same area. Look at that picture. Wow. So 63,000 feet today. And on June 25th, we had a 42,000 feet ash plume shot up into the atmosphere. And I believe that one had a consistent ash plume flow of 44,000 feet afterwards. So it was, I'm sorry, I take that back. It was 42,000 feet. It was the ash plume. And then I think it was 22,000 feet. That was a continuous ash plume into the atmosphere. So within two days, we saw two pretty big eruptions from this volcano. And it is not a coincidence, folks. Not one bit. Uh, low solar activity, more cosmic radiation, exposure to our planet, heating up our core. And hey, listen, guys, don't forget the atmosphere is cooling. So when the atmosphere is cooling and the inside of our planet is heating, you're going to have contractions, contracting, meaning earthquakes, volcanic eruptions. Uh, you know, I was speaking to a friend the other day. We were talking about magma flow from Kilauea. And I don't know if you guys noticed the difference in the glow of the magma 
which was bright yellow versus that burnt orange look that we usually see lava that bright yellow represents the amount of highly charged particles that is penetrating our core and the magma underneath it's bright never seen it like this before and that's why some people think that we might be in for a longer grand solar minimum cooling period than just 30 years they're worried about things like that and, and honestly guys even with uh, Zarkova's paper and the NASA scientist um, Kita Shavili those two things alone or what's most important is the intermittent as the immediate future which both people are indicating lower solar activity and for the upcoming future as well this prediction was announced because of the acceptance of Zarkova's work I believe everybody else was coming in high with sunspot counts for the 25th cycle not the NASA scientist and not Zarkova John Casey his work is not going unnoticed as well his book upheaval talks about what's happening right now so many things are lining up right now correlations Mari did a wonderful job putting together a keynote presentation so we can kind of get a taste of what this paper is talking about we are definitely heading into a cooling period I don't have to say that in layman's term or sugarcoat it it's all over the news when you look at what's happening to crops when you look at record flooding when you look at the outlook temperatures for the month of July and the middle of the country is light blue well that's because of all the soil that's it's absorbing the moisture which we all know moisture has a cooling effect so the part of the country that needs the heat the most isn't going to get it because of all the moisture our crops are being attacked in more than one way and, and just like a friend of mine in Nebraska Matt had said to me right now the crops this is just a race until the first freeze because farmers and other people who are aware of this topic understand that we could see some early freeze this year late September maybe mid-September in some spots who knows I mean we had 20 inches of snow in Colorado on the first day of summer their average on June for the month is 0.1 inches of snow but yeah 20 inches yeah global warming right Lisa Upton, anyway, that's what she says. And she thinks that solar cycle 25 is going to be a little bit stronger than 24. Anyway, the proof's in the pudding, guys. Watchers.news, what's up with that? Climate Depot, Ice Age Now. Those are just a few of websites that I go to on a daily basis to find my information and guess what they also have links to peer-reviewed papers they just don't blurt out things out of you know out of something that goes along with their agenda it's all fact-based and I think what really funny is a lot of people can't handle facts that's what it really comes down to here we go I'm gonna try to pronounce this but uh, 6.4 earthquake again on June 26th and again yesterday this is twice now this region has seen 6.3 earthquakes uh, in the last couple of days but here we go Commander Skyri Commander Sky Ostrova Russia 6.4 it was a shallow earthquake this is the second 6.3 plus to hit the region since the 6.3 1559 UTC June 25th so this one's roughly uh, just 24 hours away from the previous so here we had two days in a row in Russia totally different part of the world back-to-back 6.3 or higher earthquakes and then you have the PNG Yulon volcano erupt back-to-back -back on the 25th and the 26th um, volcano with 40,000 Ash plume on the first one and 63 on the second one. It's not a coincidence that we see these upticks happen simultaneously like this. It's being affected by space weather. Actually, today we were predicted to get some kind of 
uh, space weather influencing our magnetic field on the 25th and 26th. And ironically, here we have these two decent sized earthquakes and two large sized volcano eruptions. And remember folks, anywhere over the 35 to 40,000 feet range affects the climate in some way, if it's regional or local, either way it makes things cooler and definitely complicates the climate in those regions. How many more of these 60,000 foot ash plumes are we gonna get this year alone? as solar activity continues to drop. Guys, don't go anywhere, we'll be right back. Do you like this show? Give us a thumbs up. Wanna support us more? Share to your favorite social media platform, buy a t-shirt, or become a Patreon. All links are in the description below. All right, so tonight, kind of a shortened show, but I have a couple of things to talk about with our weather locally before we get into the um, outlook for the weather report. First, let's start with um, sawgrass fire, scorches 32 acres in the Everglades. And I know you're probably thinking, huh? Everglades, yes, Everglades, the sawgrass there. It's typically dry. This is the part of the year where it is dry and the high winds are kicking up on a frequent basis. But why is this grand solar minimum related? Well, usually we don't see fires from this, but this was actually started from a lightning strike. Uh, last week, an individual was killed in Florida while riding his motorcycle. This week, we get a 32,000 acreage burnt from a fire started by lightning sparks or from lightning strikes, I should say. It grew from 18,000 to 32,000 acres Monday night amid hot, dry conditions. As early as Wednesday after afternoon, the fire has been contained 54%. This week has been unusually warm in South Florida and it has been mainly rain-free across the region, according to AccuWeather senior meteorologist Paul Walker. The conditions likely aided the rapid spread of the fire, he added. So lightning, heat, of course, that's where you want to go for the heat, Florida, but the lightning is getting more and more intense. Uh, saw an amazing lightning strike in Dallas. And once again, I'm being told you haven't seen nothing yet. So just an example, cool, damp weather across the Northwest after a generally dry and comfortable weather grace residents in Pacific Northwest over the past few days. A slow moving storm system will bring about change in the weather pattern through the rest of the week. Damp and unseasonably cool and even severe weather will replace the pleasant conditions throughout the remainder of traditional work week. Warmth from Wednesday east of Washington and Oregon, cascades will fade as cooler air spills in on Thursday and Friday. And here we're talking about lightning may spark fires. So that is part of the damage or the possible damage that we can get from these severe thunderstorms through Wednesday evening. Hail and damaging winds, maximum of 60 miles an hour. Uh, wind gusts of 60 miles an hour. Some of these storms are likely to produce hail. Where little or no rain falls, lightning strikes could initiate wildfires. So that's back-to-back -back stories in the weather today talking about lightning caused wildfires. And I want to point out while I'm thinking about that, um, there's been all this mass hysteria from the mainstream media about all the acreage that was burned the last couple of years in the California fires. Folks, if you go back and look at history of wildfires and how much has been burnt over the years, you'll see back in the 1920s, 1930s, we had a lot more wildfires burning up our acreage than we do today. It's significantly lower. So you can't tell us that it's the increase of global warming and climate change why we're having so many wildfires because right now the wildfires are way lower than what we had in the 1920s and 30s and back then remember we weren't talking about man-made global warming there's no such thing politicians weren't quite as uh dirty as they are today storms over much of montana and neighboring areas of north dakota sasquatchin sas sasquatchin <laughs> Why can't I say that word? Saskatchewan and Alberta 
could be rather violent with the risk of few tornadoes during Thursday afternoon and night. To the west of the Cascades, a three-day stretch of raw and chilly weather on tap for Interstate 5 corridor from Seattle to Portland, Oregon. High temperatures will average a few as much 10 degrees Fahrenheit below normal in most areas through Friday. Good. They're probably ready for it. It's been unseasonably warm there, too. So, the clouds and showers accompany may like chill and prevent the strong June sunshine from alleviating any of the cool feel to the outdoor air. They're like poets over here at uh, AccuWeather. Thank you for that. So, much cooler air on the way. Heat on hold as we talked about a huge uh, heat wave building up into the west. Now we're looking at much cooler air inundating the northwest. Northeast has been kind of uh, cooler than average, but here lately we have a future of temperatures in the 80s as well. So we will leave that article as well to look at. And before we get into our GFS outlook, Tropical Storm Alvin, that's right. Tropical Storm Alvin, who is going nowhere, has been named today. And I say this because it's a, it's a Pacific storm. And this ad does not want to shut. There we go. Okay, so it's a slow news day, guys. Weather Channel, they all named it. Let's go ahead and name a storm that's not going to affect anybody. Pretty much, uh, this storm is going to go out to the middle of the Pacific. It will not affect Hawaii. As you see, it is weakening. By Saturday, winds will be at 30 miles per hour. This will be a non-story by Thursday afternoon. For sure. Unusually late a storm. It's not unusual for opening month of Atlantic season to be quiet. While we already had a short-lived subtropical storm, Andrea, in late May, a typical Atlantic season may not see its first name storm until the second week of July. But it's slow. Trust me. It's slow. Uh, the last time we had this start, July 2nd, 2016, three years ago. That is unusually slow, too. So what do we have in common? El Nino, of course. El Nino creates wind shear. Does not allow hurricanes to hold it together to make landfall. So there's your correlation. And good for you, AccuWeather, for also making that connection on why we are looking at a slow start to hurricane season. And what's funny to me is that last year... You had all those uh, politicians and global warming people out there trying to tell you how we are going to experience more intense hurricanes because of human activity. And we're seeing just, in fact, two years in a row now, we've seen temperatures in the northern Atlantic lower than what they're supposed to be for this time. In fact, here we are. um, Right now, we're almost at zero. We're at 0.159 in the north in the index of sorry, this is the El Nino 3-4 index. However, North Atlantic has been struggling to stay above baseline as well. Right now it's on the decline. It is also sitting at 0.104 above baseline. So temperatures in the North Atlantic are dropping. Enso meter is at neutral. And folks, uh, I've already heard from a lot of reliable sources that we will see a pretty much quick transition into a La Nina. So that is coming up. So good grief on top of what we all know will be the beginning of the solar minimum in 2020 when the solar cycle 25 begins and the real low solar activity begins to set in on top of a La Nina, on top of cooling atmospheres, on top of cooling oceans. Whew. Let's look at our live radar right now, satellite imagery. Let's go ahead and take you to the GFS. Rain is everywhere across the Midwest where we don't need it at the very top of the Mississippi, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio. Looking at rain, parts of Northwest, or I'm sorry, uh, the Northeast had some showers earlier. Those are moving out. And again, just an overall typical rainy pattern here for much of the south, the Midwest, the Ohio Valley, the south. And as we move into early next week, again, across the Plain States, South Dakota, Nebraska, 
Uh, what's important here is that we really do need some dry days here in states like Nebraska. So let's see how many dry days we get in the entire state of Nebraska starting from today. Still dry, June 29th. Some spotty showers on the 30th and then maybe in the northwest corner. We'll still count them as dry, so three days now. And then here we get another chance across July 1st. So we can't go more than four days without getting a chance of heavy rain. And this red-orange area right here does not look good. I've heard a lot of farmers say they need about 10 days of no rain to get things going. But look, as we look into the future, here's July. Most of the northeast and the midwest in your day with widespread scattered rain. July 2nd, more rain for that region, moves into July 3rd. Now the Northern Plains shuffling into the Midwest. Once again, Ohio, Dayton, Ohio, West Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, North Carolina, South Carolina. Fourth of July, there's gonna be fireworks all right. Check this out. This just explodes right over South Dakota. So I bet your ass we can, sorry about the language there, but bet your bottom dollar we can get some flooding rains out of this on the 4th of July still moisture across the Ohio Valley. This storm races off into Canada by the end of the 4th and more rain sticking around in Ohio, Tennessee, Kentucky. Finally, Friday, July 5th, just when you thought there was a chance of drier weather, more rain showers develop and go into the weekend on Saturday. Meanwhile, the same line of storms that just keeps popping up right over the Central Plains, the Central United States. Just the atmosphere just keeps reloading and throwing showers here and throwing showers here and throwing showers here and throwing showers there. So the few days of dry weather in Nebraska and Ohio, enjoy it. The GFS is not very favorable of too many streaks of dry days. There I just counted three more days of dry weather for Nebraska and Ohio before once again the atmosphere reloads and starts throwing more moisture into Kansas, Nebraska, Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Kentucky, Tennessee, West Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Florida. Not surprising. And I want to share one other thing too before I get Mari involved and say hello to everybody in the chat. But referring back to this paper, and the disclosure we've had from our NASA scientists on Solar Cycle 25. Uh, I held a training meeting for my company a couple of days ago. And during that meeting, I got to meet some folks that work throughout the district. And the one fellow that, that, that probably won't ever leave my mind at this point. His name is Rory and he is from Jamaica. And we started talking about the importance of Dr. Zarkova and her work and I was excited about the paper. It just got released the day prior and was talking a little bit about it. Some of the new research that's coming out on the climate. And Rory, the gentleman from Jamaica, started talking about the sun with me. His, he has a very thick accent. Then he was trying to say this around the sun. You know, he just kept doing this. And I thought, a halo? I, you talking about a halo that goes around the sun? And he finally just drew a circle of the sun, drew a bigger circle around the sun, sun halo, and then shaded in around the sun inside the halo. And immediately... It takes me back to the days of when Lee Wheelbarger was telling me about how c cloud nucleation, cosmic radiation creates that film, that waxy paper look that's over the sun. When you look at these halos, it looks like someone threw a piece of wax paper over it. So it's blocking the sun almost. That's cloud nucleation from cosmic rays and other particulates that are interacting together. And, I, and that's what I told him when I showed that to him or when he showed that to me. And then he looks at me and he says, in my country, the farmers say that when you see this in the sky, heavy rains are coming. Of course. So 
again, this guy wasn't scientific. He had no idea about solar cycles. He just knew that the elderly people of his country that were in the agriculture department knew that when they saw these halos in the sky with the film look around the sun, they knew that heavy rains were on the way. They didn't know that that was cosmic rays. They didn't know that. They didn't know cosmic rays, highly charged particles interact with our clouds and our and our other particulates in the atmosphere and help boost how much rain we get. The reason why we're seeing, just like on watchers.news, there's a couple articles I probably could have went over late tonight um, on watchers.news, speaking of cosmic rays. Here, we'll just go ahead and take a stroll over there. On the Mexican-Texas border, we had a ton of rain drop in just four hours. Why is that? Cosmic rays. 11 inches of water fell from the sky on the 24th of June in four hours. I bet you they see a ton of halos down here. So, the more and more I think about what I do, this is my passion. I've always been fascinated with weather. And I can't tell you the chills that I received when this Jamaican told me that his family, who are farmers, tell everyone that when they see these halos in the sky, this is an indication of heavy rains to come. And he's right. And so are those farmers. And not just because of the halo, but what the halo represents. Look, we don't see these halos during solar maximums. We're only getting photos of these halos during minimums. Let's think about it. I bet you there was very, very few halo pictures in 2014. I promise you that. So with that being said, I'm going to bring Mario over here and have her say hello to everybody before we sign off for the night. Mari, we've been busy today. Tomorrow's a big day. We've got Valentina Zarkova. Um, you know, what can you tell our loyal listeners about what to expect for tomorrow night? Or uh, you know, it's very exciting. I think the biggest thing I'd like to clarify is ever since the GWPF presentation with the infamous blurred out slides, people have blown out of like blown out of proportion and sort of made up their own speculated yeah definitely speculated their own conclusions to what these slides were about and i think the biggest thing that i'd like to clarify with people is what a super grand minimum is and no we're not going into it we actually are halfway coming out of it and and it, also the fact that the warming isn't her trying to get funding from the global warmest. Wow. She's not uh, on that agenda whatsoever. Some pretty nasty accusations <laughs> out there. She was excited when I spoke to her originally about this paper, uh, about how this work pulls the chair out from underneath AGW theory. If you actually go through the math and understand it, it shows that yes, we cool and warm on natural cycles and they if you do the math it, you cannot attribute AGW with this natural warming trend so yeah it's the balls in their court to explain that and they're not going to be able to and it's it's really once you put the pieces together it's it's a brilliant paper and she stepped it up from her last paper and fine-tuned everything and this is a model that she's worked tirelessly on with her team and nothing in science is perfect it's trial and error so if you want to criticize her last paper she learned from that paper took all the feedback she got from that and put that work into new papers reworking her forecast i think it's brilliant before i forget the spoiler uh, minimum was not included in her work because of the fact that it, she argues this and it's publicly known but a supernova named Vela is partly to blame for that unscheduled minimum that did not match with the rest of the calculations and again that only happened that nova only happened 600 700 light years away so that was relatively close 
I know you're saying 600 light years, that's tons of, but it's, it is close when you talk about supernovas and how far away they usually occur. So to me, it makes sense that that space radiation that we received from that nova caused our uh, planet to go into a minimum like cycle due to all the space radiation cosmic rays that we were under attack from during that time. Yeah, I believe that was another accusation from today yeah. that was, she said... So it was included, but it's not part of the actual yeah, solar She definitely yeah. factored that in, no doubt, if you actually read the paper. Um, so, I'm excited about that. I had something else. I got totally uh, distracted. I do want to say a hi to a few new people. Ophelia's portrait says they're in Omaha, Nebraska, and it's been raining almost every day there. Uh, they spoke to a farmer who comes into the city to sell produce, and they said most farmers can't even plant. The ground is just still too wet. So it's it's sad. They said most farmers can't hey, even Jake, plant. Jake, you're making me repeat myself. <laughs> Um, let's see what else. I, I didn't really take notes from the chat. It's like a lot to take in. Bottom line is, uh, what happened today, we're not going to let that distract us or anything. We'll, we'll have Valentina clear up any questions you guys may have. So leave your questions in the comments and we'll definitely get to them. Um, and you know, hopefully I'll be able to speed edit that and have it done by tomorrow. So... I, I, th I think that's all I have. I'm all right. sure there's so many other things I want to say, but it's like, I'm so tired. Today. Well, and not just that, but <laughs> I, like I said, we'll let our work speak for itself. And that's going to be coming out tomorrow as well. Um, again, I'm not going to play a part of any kind of games that will give out any more bad information that we can avoid doing. And right now I feel like that some of the work that's been done today from another channel, a bigger channel, which surprisingly is putting a lot of energy into a channel that's nowhere near the size of his. But again, I, I think it's counterproductive to be that arrogant and to be that in your face about it. I do believe he referred himself as the commander of the sun. The commander of the sun, well, you know. He's a master of karate Hi. and friendship for everyone. All right, guys, that's gonna do it for us tonight. Thank you for tuning in to the Grand Solar Minimum. Again, we'll be back tomorrow with uh the interview with valentina zarkova so stick around for that tomorrow night we will hopefully announce that via twitter and facebook that way you all can tune in to the premiere of valentina zarkova discussion on the super grand solar minimum and her recently released paper on nature.com that's going to do it for us tonight guys thanks for tuning in again we'll talk soon please like and share and subscribe guys